Okay. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all our colleagues watching this uh, Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology webinar. And this is the part two of our series, Acute Coronary Syndromes, part two. And uh, today we'll be dis uh, dis discussing a lot of controversial issues uh, in STEMI, non-STEMI, uh, which is one of the major uh, important uh, diagnoses that we see as cardiologists. And uh, there's a lot of uh, issues that we are going to discuss, uh, including primary PCI versus thrombolysis, delayed or early PCI in non-STEMI, complete or single revascularization in uh, STEMI, and also patients with shock and the patients with the young MI. My co-chair is Dr. Wang, who is Associate Professor of Cardiac Surgery at the National Taiwan University Hospital. Uh, we have four uh, speakers today from different parts of Asia. Uh, we have uh, Afzal Rahman, who is from uh, Bangladesh, and he is the director of the National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease in Dhaka, Bangladesh. We have Dr. Mahmoud Trainer, who is director of the cath lab at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. We have Masato Nakamura, who is professor of cardiovascular medicine uh, in the Ohashi Medical Center, Tokyo, Japan. And finally, we have Kok Han Chi, who is professor of cardiology at the University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. We will start with Dr. Mahmoud, and he is going to talk about uh, acute STEMI complicated with cardiogenic shock, keys to decision-making. Let me just share my screen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Weil and Dr. Wang for the introduction. It's an honor to be here with you all today. And uh, it's a kind of a complex topic, but hopefully I can shed a little bit of light on it in the, in the time that we have. I have no... Uh, no, no disclosures relevant to this talk. So basically there's a few key questions I think that we need to try to emphasize in this uh, setting in patients with acute MI and cardiogenic shock. So I think um, this seems like a clear answer, but I, I, I don't think the data really shows this, but is hemodynamic support necessary? And if we do so, which device is best? More recent question comes up is do, do shock teams help? And then finally, should non-culprit vessels be treated in the setting of acute shock? So the progress in innovation in uh, cardiogenic shock and adoption improvement have, has been a slow process. The first balloon pump was developed 54 years ago, uh, inserted by a surgical cut down, had really limited use. Mortality was over 80% at that time. Then in the 70s, we got the development of initial balloon angioplasty and primary PCI insertion of balloon pumps and mortality started to come down. By the uh, late 90s, the use of primary PCI was, at least in the, in the US and most of the world, has, has steadily increased. And the use of balloon pumps steadily increased and mortality was down to 50%. But base, basically since then, it's been at a relatively steady state. Up until more recent, we finally got a randomized trial, a large randomized trial in 2012. So there was 23 years uh, from the first PCI use to first randomized trial in cardiogenic shock, and it took 46 years for the first balloon pump large randomized trial to be done. And another issue with these pa patients in cardiogenic shock is the, is the extremely small sample size that we see in trials as compared to other areas of uh, cardiovascular care. And this is kind of just a sample size of some of the recent dedicated trials. And if we look at these, the total in the last two decades, only about 2,500 patients with shock were randomized worldwide. So only 0.05% of acute MI with shock worldwide were randomized. So we, we have a very limited, uh, uh, sparse database to kind of work with in terms of actual randomized data. And a lot of the commonly used therapies we use in shock are not subjected to randomized controlled th trials. So Right heart catheterizations was not studied in shock, was studied in stable heart failure patients. Uh, inotropes like dobutamine and milrinone are commonly used. There's no, no randomized data looking at these. What specific anticoagulation, antiplatelet agents, uh, IV agents like bivalirudin or tangalore, not studied in shock. Uh, stent usage was not studied in shock. BMS was used in the shock trial. ECMO therapy up until recently was not studied in shock or arrest patients. So it's a bit, been a difficult area to tackle. And I think um, a lot of it 
uh, comes from the definition of shock and how do we define a patient and patients change their status pretty quickly in these sick patients. So this guy uh, came up with a classification recently last year for classifying shock. And this is, provides twofold, one to a way to approach these patients in a more systematic way. But secondly, it also allows for developing of trials targeting various levels and maybe not the, the therapy for each stage of shock shouldn't be the same. So it's kind of a, a pyramid uh, shape where at the bottom you have patients at risk. So these are patients that have large MIs, um, acute and chronic heart failure, but are not having any signs of symptoms of shock. Um, Stage B is those that are beginning stages of shock. So they're starting to get a little hypotensive, relative uh, hypotension, but they're still perfusing, still mentating well. We start to get to stage C where we have the true classic shock. So that's where patients have evidence of hyperperfusion. They're not mentating well. There's evidence of organ uh, involvement. They're needing support with inotropes and pressors and, and, uh, and, and, and other support. And then stage D is the same as the C, but they're further deteriorating. So they're getting worse. Um, they continue to progress. And then finally, stage E is the extremis or, or circulatory collapse. This is patients with refractory cardiac arrest, persistent CPR, uh, kind of uh, advanced stage or uh, end stage uh, shock patients. And then when we look at device therapy, so does one size or device fit all of these classifications? So there's three stages of devices that there's, there's a, uh, you know, pl uh, plenty of devices that are used in shock. We focus on the left ventricular support devices. Basically, can, the primary devices are three. So we have the balloon pump, the old and tried and true uh, device, easy to put in, uh, affordable cost, uh, some relatively small French, but provides a pretty low amount of actual uh, cardiac output support. Impella, which is also pretty easy to put in, uh, a little bit larger sheath size, um, more support in the three to four liter range, um, cost becomes more of an issue with this device. And then finally, uh, we have the maximum support of VA ECMO, which can provide up to seven liters of support, but needs large bore arterial and venous sheaths to put in. Now, the variability of usage of support devices varies. So this is just kind of a sampling from the uh, trial we'll talk about later, the culprit shock trial, looking at multivessel PCI in, uh, in, uh, in cardiogenic shock. And in this trial, which is mostly a European trial, mechanical circulatory support was only used in 28%. And it kind of varied across the subgroups. So some patients got balloon pump, a quarter of those that got devices got balloon pump, about 40% got impellas, a couple got uh, tandem hearts, and ECMO in about 20%. So it's still kind of a variable what people use and still somewhat underused. Now, if you look at the US trends of use, balloon pump usage has pretty much stayed the same over the, uh, from between 2004 and 2011, but there was a dramatic increase in the use of percutaneous mechanical circulatory supports, meaning impellas and its, uh, and its analogs um, and ECMO use. And that's dramatically increased. Now, if we look at it, this is the number on the, on the left side is of the mechanical devices versus the right is balloon pump. So balloon pump usage has stayed stable around 50,000 these devices have trended up to about 3,000. So, so we're still talking small numbers, but again, with all the confounders, there does seem to be some improvement in mortality rate seen with this. Now, when we talk about the randomized trial, the first randomized trial was the CRISP AMI, which is a relatively small trial, looking at balloon pump in patients without shock. So these are patients with large anterior MIs. So more of a uh, if you if you go back now, obviously it wasn't at the time, but more of a, a stage uh, A or B kind of patients. And this, again, was a small trial, but did show a trend towards a significant reduction in the co combined endpoint of death, shock, or new or worsening heart failure. So kind of some support for balloon pump maybe in the early phases of, of, uh, of shock. The IABP shock trial was a randomized trial in patients with full-on shock and looked at one-year all-cause mortality. And this was kind of a surprising result in 2013, which showed no benefit to the use of balloon pump in shock patients. So when we look at the predictors of mortality in patients with shock in this trial, and, and to try to explain what is negative, the two strongest predictors were age and stroke. 
and those were both mm -hmm. not modified by any acute intervention. So, so those are fixed fixed uh, outcomes. But if we looked at the next three main modified modifiable risk factors, lactate, oliguria, and pH, those are all signs of the degree of shock. And so those all suggest that they, if we support more, maybe we could have gotten more benefit in those patients. But if we look specifically at Impella and the, and the uh, randomized trials to support its use, it's been extremely challenging to randomize in these trials. So almost all the trials were discontinued early due to lack of enrollment and difficulty in getting these patients, patients into these trials. And I think this is a kind of a worldwide problem where we're having trouble getting patients into randomized trials for shock. Now, with all, these, with all the limitations of these being small uh, studies that were discontinued early when they compared mechanical circulatory support to balloon pump, across these trials, there was no benefit in mortality. But if we look at the kind of groups of patients, so the patients with more hypotension, lower blood pressure favors mechanical circulatory support, and those with higher lactates for favored mechanical circulatory support. So if we targeted the sicker patients in these trials, there may be a signal that there's benefit to mechanical circulatory support. So if we kind of look at back at the SKY algorithm and try to come up with an individualized device approach, kind of a reasonable approach would be to consider in the, in the class A and the stage A and stage B patients, balloon pump may be a reasonable option for these patients to support them through their, uh, their initial shock while the uh, MI is being treated. For the more advanced C and D patients, Impella may be a good choice. And these are the patients that are gonna have signs of hypoperfusion and may benefit from higher levels of, uh, of circulatory support. And obviously for the extremist patients, I think that's where we need to start considering ECMO. So when we look at clinical objective supports, obviously there's two components. We need to get coronary perfusion and we need to get circulatory and ventricular support. And that's where the percutaneous uh, support devices uh, help. So there's been a big push, I think, in the, uh, in the last five to 10 years about trying to develop more of a systematic approach and pro protocols and pathways are a key. Now, this is one algorithm uh, promoted by Bill O'Neill and the National CSI uh, group in, in the US, but trying to develop a algorithmic approach to cardiogenic shock. So rapid identification, activation of the cath lab, fem getting femoral access, standardizing the approach across operators, early identifying the, these shock patients, using hemodynamic-based assessment, and early, early uh, institution of mechanical circulatory support as needed, with reassessment and, and escalation and weaning as needed. And this is kind of their data. Again, these are, these are data, obviously, that's going to be hard to compare and hard to, uh, to decide you know, if, it's, if it's really from the intervention or it's the data collection. There's a lot of confounding factors. But with this kind of method, they've been able to achieve a 28% mortality compared to more historical controls around 50% with, with this kind of uh, usage of, of, uh, of this kind of algorithm. It's been similarly seen in other groups. So the Wellstar Group's a big uh, hospital system in uh, Georgia and the US. And when they looked at, when they instituted a cardiogenic shock algorithm using the CSI model, their, their previous mortality was around 50%. And their uh, uh, survival was around 50%, and survival was able to increase to 70%. Again, with a referral system, all shock patients from the smaller hospitals got transferred into the larger uh, referral center for, to manage these patients. Similarly, with the Inova Shock Registry, another group, again, in, uh, in the Northeast US, they saw similar findings. So when they inst instituted a shock protocol and a an, uh, shock team and algorithms, they were able to improve their survival from around 44% with acute MI up to 80%. And even with acute decompensated heart failure, able to improve it from 60% to 72% with a significant amount of additional lives saved. So what are the limitations in shock care? I think, I think this, is, this is, to me, is equally as important as the choice of device and support that we use, is that there's a lot of systematic issues that limit uh, our shock care. So there's fractured care. Um, you have surgeons in one silo and cardiologists in another silo and ER and uh, intensivists in another silo. So a developing a formal process for multidisciplinary evaluation of the patients, 
trying to improve communication across the, all these disciplines that are uh, integral for the patient's care. Patients are often detected very late. So by the time people are considering um, advanced therapies for, for these shock patients, they're often too sick or, uh, to, uh, and it's too late to really for them to benefit. There's impaired access to care. So this is systems in transfer, delays in transfer, late recognition at the uh, maybe the smaller hospitals that will transfer out and then variations in care. So every provider and every physician and every center kind of does things differently. And so they have different systems to monitor and leads to, uh, to issues with the care. This is kind of just a, one example that I, that I really liked um, that uh, we're looking to model our own shock team on, but from a, the Innova group where they kind of had a systematic approach, team-based, hemodynamic-based assessment, and again, can decide on the therapies that based on based on these criteria of uh, for refractory shock and kind of upgrading the therapy as as needed. So obviously, the specific uh, you know of each model can kind of vary of the specific therapies and what's available and what's cost cost uh, dependent in, in your in in your region and resources, et cetera, et cetera. I think those those all can vary, but developing a local system to address these patients, I think, will make a tremendous benefit for our patients in general. So next, when we talk about the other major issue is revascularization. So what do we do with uh, in shock and multivessel disease? So, you know, there's basically four approaches. You can do the culprit lesion only. That was the historic um, um, me measure that we did with all acute MI patients. You could do the culprit lesion and then staged revascularization planned later for the other vessels. You can send them for an emergency cabbage, which I think at this point has been pretty disproven in terms of risks for the patient and the very high mortality, or immediate multivessel PCI. And this triggered a lot of interest because of the trials starting from the PRIMI and the culprit trial, where we saw in patients with STEMI, multivessel PCI dramatically improve patients. And if you think about it, you would consider, well, maybe if multivessel PCI helps in STEMI without shock, maybe with shock we'll have even more benefit. So a meta-analysis was done of registry data, so looking at multivessel PCI and cardiogenic shock. And in short-term follow-up, actually this favored doing only the culprit. And then when we looked at, when it was looked at in longer-term follow-up, again, no, no benefit, you could go either way. So the data was not clear and a clear plan and recommendation based on registry data, and this led to um, the guidelines, which in, as, as of 2017, in the ESC, it was a 2A recommendation actually, based on the PRAMI and culprit and, and the earlier trials and the complete trial, that, that uh, you can do multi-vessel PCI in the setting of STEMI. The ACCHA did not have any specific recommendations, but it did get an appropriate use criteria of A and a level of evidence of nine. So it, it was a pretty, pretty good a, a criteria for, to in favor in this in spite of the lack of data in the specific sub, subset of, of patients. So the culprit shock trial was a very nice trial, well done trial published in 2017, looking at this specific group of patients. So patients with shock in acute MI, wasn't just STEMI, but it also included non-STEMI and saying, if we treated all the, the non-culprit lesions as well, would, what would be the outcome? And they nicely looked at a combined endpoint of all-cause mortality or need for dialysis. And it showed a dramatic increase in the primary endpoint. So worsening of mortality and need for dialysis in patients that got immediate multivessel PCI. And the, this was primarily driven by a difference in mortality. So patients died more if non-culprit lesions were treated in that initial uh, procedure. And this effect lasted out to a year. So it did not the curves did not come back uh, to overlap. So there's a still significant difference between the, the, two, the two groups of patients out to a year. And if we looked across all the subgroups, there's really uh, no, no real trend to any subgroup primarily benefiting from immediate multivessel PCI. So across all subgroups, age, amount of disease, uh, STEMI or not, anterior or not, they all, they, uh, the trends all generally favored culprit lesion only PCI. So this led to a change in the European guidelines um, with an update in 2018, moved it to class three to do multi-vessel PCI in the immediate setting. This doesn't of course preclude later stage PCI after the patient's stable and improves and uh, out of shock. But in the initial setting, that's what we get. So in summary and conclusion, um, 
the data on mechanical circulatory part and cardiogenic shock is mostly limited to registry data. And we really need to have developed new approaches to, to, to data collection and to finding ways to randomize these sick patients maybe that are uh, not able to give consent and finding ways to get better data in these patients. I think develop, depending on your resources uh, available, an individualized approach in a systematic way should be in, in, undertaken based on the uh, cardiogenic shock stage. Understanding the hemodynamics is extremely important in the decision-making, so uh, liberal use of right heart catheterization, EDP, to kind of make these decisions. I think system-based approaches to shock with shock teams can improve outcomes. And then finally, you know, fix the culprit and get out um, in the acute setting, get the patient stabilized, and then you can consider further stage PCI on a late, later basis based on clinical response. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mahmoud. That was an excellent uh, overview of the treatment of uh, STEMI with shock. I'd like to open for a discussion with our group here. Uh, Dr. Wang, I know in Taiwan you have a very uh, well-developed ECMO program. What is your experience with ECMO and shock? Yeah, well, uh, in, in our hospital, we usually use the ECMO for such kind of uh, cardiogenic shock. And because uh, we have a uh, uh, rapid response team, so we can easily to put on the ECMO within half an hour as soon as we meet the patient. So um, in our hospital, my exper our experience, our team experience is that uh, when we met a collagen shock and put on the ECMO, for the MCS and then goes to the CAS lab. If we cannot open the corporate region, or even we open the corporate region, but the heart is still stunning or still VFVT, then we will directly move to the operation room to do the full, uh, total revascularization so that we can uh, restore the heart functions as soon as possible. So we don't, we don't wait for the uh, stab, uh, stabilize uh, PCI, you know, because uh, it will last him for days and uh, probably the heart will lose more muscles. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Okay, with that, then we'll go on to the second uh, uh, talk today. Um, Dr. Nakamura will talk about uh, STEMI complicated with cardiac arrest. Please go ahead. Dr. Masako, please uh, open your microphone. Thank you, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please wait. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. My talk today, I will talk about the strategic strategy for acute STEMI and non STEMI complicated with cardiogenic arrest. The key issue is the decision making. I have nothing to disclose. Today, I will talk about the three issues. First of all, the classification of out of hospital cardiac arrest. Actually, the classification is very useful to guide the treatment. And secondly, I will talk about the catheterization for, the, for such kind of patient. Catheterization itself is harmful or beneficial. And who is the best candidate for coronary angiography after resuscitation? And so, finally, I will talk about the intervene a little bit. Uh, usually, the outward hospital cardiac arrest will be classified into two groups. One is a non-shockable out of cardiac arrest. The other is a shockable cardiac arrest. A shockable cardiac arrest usually associated with the VF and the pastor's VT. 
On the other hand, non-shock abroad outbook hospital cardiac arrest associated with cardiac arrest for pulse stress electrical activity. When I look at the Minnesota experience over five years, it, uh, this paper was published in a uh, circulation. Uh, shock abroad outbook hospital cardiac arrest approximately 20% of all. In contrast, uh, this group the uh, survival rate without neurological function is approximately 6%. Therefore, the shock cover out of hospital cardiac arrest seems to be a good sign. And the next to the, uh, the patient with shock cover out of hospital cardiac arrest will be classified in two groups. One is the return of spontaneous circulation, the other is the refractory VFVT. Actually, most survivors achieve long return of spontaneous circulation within 15 minutes after resuscitation. And these cases are further subdivided in two groups based on the STT changes. Coronary artery disease is the most common underlying cause of shock of cardiac arrest. However, the incidence of cardiac arrest, uh, coronary artery disease seems to be different based on STT changes. If we can find that the ST elevation after uh, resuscitation, the pro, uh, incidence of a significant coronary artery disease is more than 70%. And also we can find that acute region approximately 80% of the cases. Therefore, when I look at the uh, ESC guideline 2017, a primary TCI strategy is recommended in patients with resuscitated cardiac arrest and electrocardio consistent with stain. Uh, given the high prevalence of coronary occlusion, urgent angiography within two hours should be considered in survivor of cardiac arrest. In this category, including unresponsive survivors and also suspicious for ongoing infection. If patient has a uh, presence of chest pain before arrest, or if patient has a history of established coronary artery disease, and also if patient has abnormal and certain electrocardio uh, um, finding, in such a patient, the cardio uh, CAG will be recommended. Next to scenario is no ST elevation. In this scenario, the uh, significant coronary artery disease actually less than 50 percent and also acute region seem to be one, less than one third of them therefore the catheterization for out of hospital cardiac, cardiac arrest without st elevation is a problem is it harmful or beneficial who is the best candidate for coronary angiography after resuscitation Who is the right patient? When there is no evidence of STEMI on electrocardiogram, identification, identification of patient who has arrest a coronary codes is surprisingly challenging. It's very difficult to determine which patient should be go undergo coronary angiography. When I think about rationale of catheterization, Catheterization itself will provide useful information for diagnosis. Actually, we can directly uh, check the coronary region and the thrombotic occlusion. Therefore, the coronary angiography will guide further therapy. And also, coronary angiography will allow the immediate revascularization. The revascularization itself stabilizes the hemodynamic status and improve the prognosis. And also, coronary angiography will provide access to access to uh, circulatory assist device. Previous speakers talked about the uh, ECMO and also IVP and impair such kind of the uh, access devices will be stabilized the patient. However, we have to think about the dark side of catheterization. Unnecessary coronary angiography may be harmful because of the delayed 
intensive support and target temperature management. Electrocardiogram is the first diagnostic tool to discriminate coronary artery disease. However, post resuscitation of electrocardiogram regularly show wide spread uh, depolarization and the conduction abnormality. Therefore, it's a very difficult to diagnose the uh, uh, actual coronary artery disease. <coughs> How about the troponin T? Troponin T is a very useful tool to diagnose uh, acute my myocardial infarction. However, again, after the uh, uh, resuscitation, troponin T is not useful. In this paper, uh, clearly demonstrated, uh, they uh, evaluate the clinical variables associating with significant coronary artery disease after resuscitation. You can see abnormal troponin T and also STT abnormality was not, it was not the predictor of the coronary artery disease. Strong uh, predictor was the, the history of coronary artery disease, disease and initial rate of VFVT. That means the shock cover or non shock cover with uh, cardiac arrest. So, how to manage uh, such kind of uh, patient without the ST elevation? Uh, recently, uh, uh, actually, two papers, uh, three papers published. Why is the New England Journal of 2019 coapt trial? And this year, the trial was published, and also this year, meta analysis was published. The COVID trial was uh, published in 2019, last year. The background of this trial is uh, that many observational studies suggested the favorable outcomes for the immediate coronary angiography but still it's controversial. The hypothesis itself is the strategy of immediate coronary angiography could improve the prognosis compared with a conservative strategy. The hypothesis is 90 days mortality will be 45% versus 32%. May inclusion and exclusion the criteria was shown in this slide, eligible patient or successfully resuscitation patient, and the STEMI and the shock and the obvious non coronary cause of arrest and the renal dysfunction was excluded from this study. A total of 538 resuscitated patients was included during 2015 to 2018 from 90 centers in the Netherlands. In the immediate angiography group, I conducted a coronary angiography within two hours. And actually, when I look at the patient, more than 97% of the patient in this group, coronary angiography was conducted. And after that, thrombotic occlusion was defined 3.4% and the vascularization was conducted approximately 40% of them. The other group is a delayed angiography after neurological recovery. In this group, uh, coronary angiography was con underwent 64.9% and the thrombotic occlusion was defined in 7.6% and the vascularization was conducted in approximately 32%. When I look at the 90 days mortality, as you can see clearly, there is no difference. And also, uh, this outcome is maintained in one year. A uh, peer trial, this is the angiography in this state of patient without ST elevation. One group is angiography within two numbers. The other group is more than six numbers. Again, this trial did not demonstrate the clinical benefit of early angiography. And in this trial, carpet region was observed in 47% and 50% in CTO. And finally, meta-analysis are published in JAK Cardiology, Interventional Cardiology. So in this trial, meta-analysis also 
that do not demonstrate the clinical benefit of early corner angiography in terms of the mortality. How to interpret these findings? A look at the COVID trial, we can find the interaction in several uh, important factors. When I look at the age, if the patient less than 70 years, maybe early angiography has a beneficial. And also, if the patient has a history of coronal angiography, early angiography may be beneficial. However, it should be confirmed by hypothesis generating prior. The other group, the right angiography group, was basically coronal angiography was postponed after neurological recovery. However, in some patients, urgent coronal angiography was conducted. In such a touch, uh, in this group, cardiogenic shock, or if patient has a recurrent ischemic shortening arrhythmia, and if patient has a recurrent ischemia during hospitalization, in such a patient, even though the uh, delayed group, urgent angiography was conducted. And finally, we, we have to think about the cause of death. Actually, the uh, mortality was almost the same. When I focus on the cause of death, also in even though the immediate group and the delayed group, the cause of death are almost identical. New, most frequent cause of death was neurological problem. Neurological death was approximately to, approximately three times higher compared with the cardiogenic or arrhythmia, cardiogenic uh, death. Therefore, we have to think about optimal vital organ support with a minimal delay, time delay is crucial. Immediate coronary angiography will maybe not contribute to neurological recovery. We have to think about it. <clears throat> Therefore, in 2017, ESG guideline did not recommend uh, early angiography, just uh, class 2A recommended just without uh, urgent angiography should be considered in patient with resuscitated cardiac arrest, uh, but high suspicious ongoing myocardial ischemia. Therefore, we have to quickly evaluation of non coronary cause is essential, and the indication of emergent coronary angiography was in the case without uh, poor neurological outcomes. If the patient has unwitnessed cardiac arrest, late arrival, and more than long, long time uh, life support or uh, CPR, such kind of the patient should be postponed. And finally, the patient, if the patient is VFVD, the coronary artery, the incidence of coronary artery is, is greater than 75%. And high prevalence of the arch base of disease and also CTO is documented. Therefore, in, in this uh, scenario, uh, such kind of patient should be directly to catch up. Actually, uh, VA ECMOS uh, supported angiography evaluation in patient with refractory VFVD reveals that. More than 80% of the patient has a significant coronary artery disease. And also, then when I look at the extent of coronary artery disease, more than 70% of the patient has multi-special disease. So therefore, the good candidate of coronary angiography of out of uh, hospital cardiac arrest without ST elevation, ESC guideline, and also lesson from COVID trial were quite similar. The absence of poor neurological outcomes is essential, and also high index of suspicious ongoing uh, ongoing ischemia. It, it's a very uh, important factor. And also, COVID trial, the young patient, less than 70, and the history of coronary artery disease may be some beneficial. The other side of the unshockable out of cardiac arrest patient, there is no our data so far. I, previously, I showed that this population is now more prevalent 
approximately 80% of the all of short cardiac arrest. And commonly associated with non cardiovascular disease. And strategy sterility data is not limited, therefore, actually, we cannot say exactly the strategy. And finally, I will show you the how do you intervene in cardio uh, this patient is completely revascularization is essential in patients with cardiogenic uh, arrest. Again, the carpet shock trial, the previous speaker showed that this is not beneficial, the carpet region only PCI is more better. Because the carpet shock, this trial, this included a large proportion of patients following outward cardiac arrest. More than 50% was resuscitated before randomization. Therefore, the capital shock trial will give us some information about the strategy. So, therefore, in practical, the multi basal PCI is not recommended. So, it's inhibiting the poor uh, hemodynamic responses. In such a special case, the multi basal complete revascularization should be considered. Uh, this is our final slide. In summary, resuscitation is a part. Shock of out of cardiac arrest is a good sign and refractive VFVT. Such kind, kind of patient is associated with a high uh, complex and large basal disease. Immediate coronary angiography is a very beneficial. And also, in case of STEMI, immediate coronary angiography is also beneficial. However, in case of no STEMI patient, same approach will be required. Assessment of patients to create a clinical and presentation and predict the mortality and the neurological recovery. And also, we have to evaluate the ongoing scanning. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Open for discussion. Any questions? Uh, Dr. Wang, are you online? I know in Taiwan also you have a uh, teams uh, that go out and uh, use ECMO in uh, acute uh, resuscitation for cardiac arrest. What has your experience been in Taiwan? Yes, I in our experience is that uh, if well, usually we in uh, it's very difficult to determine to save the brain first or to save the heart first. But nowadays, the most concept is that we have to save the brain first because if the heart is stunning or the heart is broken, we still can use the mechanical support or even we can use the heart transplantation, but we cannot do the brain transplantation. So always brain first. Uh, in our hospital, we will we, we have a trial to use the ECMO with a, a deep hypothermia uh, of the brain to deep uh, to deep cool the brain to below thirty Celsius degrees. So it's still undergoing a clinical trial. But uh, in the preliminary data, we we showed the uh, uh, very uh, favorable our neurological outcomes uh, and uh, also have an oral presentation in 2017 AHA Congress. Well, so uh, because uh, there is a mechanical support, so we can we can save the brain. But uh, if without a mechanical support, then uh, if the heart is a uh, some legions in the coronary, I think we still need to open the legion as soon as possible so that uh, re return the heart to study to effective beating and uh, the uh, effective reasons. Otherwise, uh, no circulation and no further uh, hopes to, to say, I think. Any other comments or questions on resuscitation? Okay. And with that, then we'll move to the third speaker, Professor Chi from Malaysia. 
and he'll talk about uh, optical med optimal medical therapy, uh, lessons learned from uh, courage and ischemia trial. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Chi. I'm coming from Malaysia. So I think we will shift a little bit from the two previous speaker. I think the two previous speaker has given us a very fantastic uh, overview of the acute situation in the cardiac uh, disorder, acute cardiac event. So I'm moving the gear towards looking at those patients who actually have stable angina or chronic coronary syndrome. So this is just to illustrate the, the two trials that bring actually important insight. How are we actually going to manage patients with chronic coronary syndrome? Mr. Lee is a 65 years old retired medical assistant. He has background history of diabetic and hypertension for about 10 years. And he has been smoking for the past 20 years. So he came to see us essentially because of angina. She have, he has chest discomfort after about walking up slope about 200 to 300 meters. And when we brought him in for a stress test, so the ST changes start to appear around stage two. So she went on and get a CT coronary angel and uh, it actually shows a mid RCA more than 75% stenosis. So the question that he will ask me, and I, I'm very sure these are the common question that your patient asks you, is that do I need an angiography and angioplasty? This is a patient uh, consider high risk diabetic hypertension smoking and uh, stress test positive at stage two, and the CT scan actually shows a uh, uh, seventy uh, uh, crit critical stenosis in the mid RCA. So the question is, what's the point and what's the benefit of PCI in the patient who has stable angina? Is it to reduce mortality, to reduce future chance of myocardial infarct, improve his exercise tolerance? reduce angina or we actually see no benefit doing an angioplasty or, or in a bigger terms, revascularization in patient with stable angina. In other words, the, the topic of my talk is actually looking at courage and ischemic trial is actually trying to answer does PCI in stable angina actually reduce cardiovascular death and or myocardial infarct. This is the study design of Courage study. This is published back in 2006 and subsequently the result come out about 2007. Essentially, the patient recruitment is similar to Mr. Lee. Uh, patient must have symptomatic angina or patient was stable after MI or documented asymptomatic myocardial ischemic. For example, patient went for a routine health checkout and found stress test positive. On one arm, as you can see here, is patient is put on optimal medical therapy. And on the other arm is actually optimal medical therapy and angioplasty. And what we are trying to look for here is to look at whether a routine PCI in this group of symptomatic patients will actually reduce all-cause mortality and or non-fatal MI. And as you all know, the result essentially shows there's actually no difference between optimal medical therapy compared with a routine PCI. Uh, this is looking at survival free of death of any cause or cause mortality, all cause mortality and myocardial infarct. And whether a routine PCI actually reduce a future event of acute coronary syndrome, again, courage trial actually show there actually no difference between the PCI versus the medical therapy. And if you look at all these endpoints, that actually shows that there's actually no difference whether the patient have only single vessel disease or multi-vessel disease, whether the patient have previous history of MI or diabetic did not change all the outcome that you have seen just now. And the outcome that you have seen just now also is similar whether whatever the RV function is and whatever the angina class is. So this is what we see essentially shows that routine PCI did not change all the endpoint. But what does it show is that if we actually do routine PCI together with optimal medical therapy, as you can see from this graph, that the patient actually have more angina free period compared with optimal medical therapy up to about 12 months. Now, what does that mean? It means that if we actually do routine PCI for this group of patient for the first 12 months compared with optimal medical therapy, PCI actually provide them more 
uh, more time in angina free, they are symptomatically better. However, this benefit seems to disappear after around one year or so. And of course, this translates into a better quality of life among patients who actually took up a routine PCI compared with medical therapy. But again, the superiority of better quality of life among routine PCI group disappear after 12 months. In other words, beyond 12 months, the quality of life for both groups essentially is the same. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, courage study actually show us there's actually no survival benefits between routine PCI versus optimal medical therapy alone. However, it does reduce the angina frequency and it does improve quality of life. There's a lot of limitation in the trial. So this is a slightly older trial. Most of the stand that was used was actually bare metal stand. Uh, male patient is occupy around 85% of the total study population. Most of the patient is either from United States or Canada. And in fact, we actually look back in the uh, nuclear imaging of the courage population, up to two thirds actually have no significant ischemia. For example, less than 10% of the heart muscle is actually suffering ischemia in nuclear imaging. So a lot of question is being asked whether what we see here <clears throat> In the courage study, we do not see routine benefit of PCI because these are maybe, you know, low risk patient, not much of ischemic load. So be, with this result, that is the reason why they run another trial called ischemia trial, which was actually announced this year. Now, the recruitment and the inclusion criteria actually learned the lesson from courage study. Essentially, they must prove patient must have severe ischemia or moderate ischemia. This is actually done by all these different kinds of tests. So for patients to be recruited in ischemic trial, they must show moderate to severe ischemia based on nuclear perfusion scan, a stress echo, a cardiac MR, or exercise stress test. So this is actually to try to correct some of the limitations that we see in current study. If they actually show ischemic in this group, in this imaging study, then all patients will actually go for coronary CT scan. This is exclude, trying to exclude all those patients who are not suitable for uh, an intervention or revascularization. For example, patients who actually have left, left main stem lesion, then they are excluded. Patients have very, very bad CTO or very, very diffuse disease, again, they are excluded. So you can see that they're actually trying to really look into comparison of revascularization plus optimal medical therapy versus just optimal medical therapy alone. So if those patients who actually get into invasive st strategy, then they actually follow what is the standard of care now. So they will get optimal medical therapy, they will get an angiogram, and then they refer to heart team to decide whether patients should go for PCI or should go for bypass. If the patient is has very, very bad disease, not suitable for revascularization, then they will put for medical therapy alone. For those uh, equivocal stenosis, then again, they will actually do an FFR. They use 0.8 as a cutoff point to decide whether the patient should go for intervention or not. So I think this actually reflects some of the modern practice of how you and I uh, practice in the cat lab. On the other arm, those patients who actually randomize the conservative strategy, so they will get a lot of optimal medical therapy. They will go for PCI only if the patient have an event, uh, for example, acute coronary syndrome, or patient actually have refractory angina, then they still can go for angioplasty or CABG, reflecting the standard of practice here. So if you want to know how many of them actually get revascularized, so in the invasive arm, up to about 79% actually receive revascularization DES is the one that actually used most uh, in the PCI group. This is again, try to correct the limitation that you have seen in current study. Lima graph was actually used in up to about 91.9% .9 in the bypass group. And in the optimal medical therapy, up to about 20% actually need to go for angioplasty or revascularization because of refractory angina, or they actually have an acute event. So I think this actually reflects very, very good practice, right? And the ischemic trial is actually, drawn, is actually done internationally. 
So reflecting uh, the uh, 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 global picture, I think up to about 20% was actually in Asia country. But again, it actually show a similar endpoint, right? If you look at the primary endpoint, namely the cardiovascular death, the MI, the hospitalization for unstable and general heart failure, all cardiac arrest, essentially there's actually no difference. In fact, for the first two years, the invasive strategy actually have more primary endpoint or primary event. And then after the second year onwards, you see that conservative strategy actually have more primary endpoint. This is what the same thing, you see more myocardial infarct initially in the invasive strategy, and then you see more conservative strategy has more MI after the second year or so. So again, it seems to be the benefit or, or, or harm seems to be neutralized throughout the five years following up. So again, it did not show any benefit for routine invasive strategy among patients with stable angina. What you see in courage, you're also seeing the same thing. Patients have much better angina-free period in ischemic trial that patient, for those patients who actually went for the routine PCI compared with conservative. Uh, same thing, the quality of life is better among patients who actually get routine PCI. And if you actually look at the various subgroup analysis, no difference whether they are single vessel disease or multi-vessel disease, whether the patient have diabetes or CKD, whatever the degree of ischemia, whether they have moderate ischemia versus severe ischemia, the outcome that you have seen from the graph just now is the same, whether proximal LAD is involved or no, no difference as far as uh, routine PCI versus optimal medical therapy. So again, ischemic trials have actually showed a similar result like courage, no survival benefit, reduce angina frequency and improve quality of life. But they also have limitation. Although you have tried to correct some of the limitation done in courage study, uh, but I think some of the things that you see here are the limitation. It's still an open label, a real world registry. There's actually no sham procedure like the orbital study. So I think the patient know and the physician know what was done to the patient. Uh, this may actually uh, change the outcome of the study. So coming back to our patient, so, so you see that the, this patient actually have positive stress tests and the CT scan actually shows severe stenosis. So what is the benefit of PCI in him based on the uh, courage and uh, ischemic study? Definitely, we are not looking at reduced mortality. We are not looking at reduced myocardial infarct. So with all this courage study, ischemic study, nowadays when we meet up with the patient uh, in this kind of situation, those patient with stable angina, I think we actually need to involve the patient. Uh, we, we talked to him for a long time, looking at pros and cons of PCI in him. Uh, we stress again the importance of lifestyle modification, especially stopping smoking. Uh, we also looking at a very aggressive medical therapy which has been shown in ischemic trial and courage down to be as good as uh, routine PCI in reducing the outcome. Now, just a quick word on what do you mean by optimal medical therapy in ischemic? So as you can see here, that's divided into two. Firstly, is a behavior risk factor. Smoking must stop. Patient must be more active and patient must look at to the diet to reduce the saturated fat for medication. Uh, in this trial, they actually very, very aggressive. Blood pressure must be less than 130. LDL must be less than 1.8. They must uh, reduce their weight. And the HbA1c is around less than 8. Now, of course, this reflects some of the older medication. For the past one or two years, uh, we have newer medication. For example, PCSK9 in this trial actually show uh, mortality benefit or, or maize benefit compared with standard therapy. We also now among diabetic patients, SGLT2 inhibitors in this Empiric study also show good outcome in maize and recently also GLP-1 semacrutide uh, in Pioneer 6 also have shown benefit. So I think definitely there are more in medical therapy that we can actually help uh, this group of patients to reduce the outcome, the maize event. But I'm very sure you are seeing this kind of patient like I'm seeing in my clinic, you know? 
they will be they have been so exposed to to block in the vessel and you must do a balloon you must do a stand so i get a lot of uh, feedback from my patient uh, after this kind of lengthy discussion so i have a block and you tell me no need to put a stand i mean it's very, very difficult sometimes to actually handle this kind of patient so after lengthy discussion uh, mr lee still insists of doing something to the block so we obliged and we actually done uh, a pci to the rca with the ffr guidance of course whatever we see in ischemic trial uh, lifestyle modification definitely has been stressed upon and these are the medication long long list of medication that this patient is on so this is just an example telling you telling all of us uh, how this courage and ischemic trial actually have uh, changed our practice we need to involve the patient more uh, in the discussion so what the two trials have actually showed us is that there actually no benefit versus optimal medical therapy as far as mortality is concerned as far as future ACS event is concerned uh, in routine PCI it does reduce angina and it does improve the quality of life I think these are the things that uh, we need to uh, get across to the patient. Um, I think from now on, looking at how we should do PCR with stable angina, I think it has to be a shared decision making. However, uh, based on what, what I have done to Mr. Lee, you know that there's a lot of resistance as far as market force is concerned. Uh, the stand company, the patient expectation, your colleagues' expectation. I think it will take a while for whatever we see from courage an ischemic study to actually translate into our practice. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for that uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like our colleagues to uh, like to start a panel discussion. Uh, my first question to the panelists, uh, uh, most of you are invasive cardiologists, has the ischemia or courage uh, trials affected your practice in your regions and hospitals? Start with you from uh, Malaysia. Has it affected any any effect, do you think? Well, I have to say that it doesn't change much. I have, have shown you just now. So um, we try to incorporate uh, whatever we learn, but unfortunately, um, patients are being sort of uh, well-educated from media and from past experience that whenever the patient have a block based on CT scan or stress test positive, they expect something to be done. Um, so if you do not want to do it because you believe in courage or ischemia, I'm very sure someone, some other intervention cardiologist down the street will do something. I, I, I'm not sure. I think this is what happened in Malaysia. I, I'm not sure uh, in Taiwan or in, in Japan whether this is a similar thing. Yeah. Mahmoud, has it affected your uh, practice? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I, he, we have a here situation where patients have a lot of options. So uh, what ends up happening usually is, if I don't fix it, they'll go. They go down to the next guy and tells them why. Why didn't you fix it? And you know, should have taken care of it. So I think, I think it it needs a more systematic approach as long as you have free market forces that as dr chi mentioned where where patients have the option of going to other things it's a it's a it's a fundamental mentality shift that needs to happen where people think i have blocked arteries and fixing it is not gonna help me um or prevent something bad from happening um it's it's really hard to it's easy to sell patients on it to open it and it's very hard it's like it's like it's like giving antibiotics for a cold it's very easy to give the antibiotics but it's very hard to convince them they don't need the antibiotics it's the yeah. same thing with the scent in this setting how are things in japan professor masoto thank you very much i i think it's very difficult to say actually we don't have no data so far however actually i think the number of the PCI cases gradually decreasing, I think so. Especially, as you know, the, after COVID, the number of the PCI cases is decreasing dramatically. Therefore, we cannot find out if it's the effect of the uh, trial data or COVID. It's very difficult to say. However, anyway, uh, many physicians believe that routine PCI is not useful. Everybody can uh, agree that uh, with that. So. 
we have to think about the indication more uh, uh, precisely. I think a little bit the attitude to PCI is uh, changing. It's my uh, just feeling. Uh, Dr. Chen is also online with us now. He's a professor of cardiac surgery from the National Taiwan University. Um, hello, Dr. Chen. I'd like to go back to um, shock uh, patients. Uh, so, uh, if we have a Mahmoud, if we have a shock patient in a in a referring hospital, what is your current practice now? So, somebody calls you and says, "I have an acute MI, and the patient is in shock in my hospital." What do you tell them to do, and what will you do when the patient comes to your hospital? I think for for, yeah, for us. Please, hello? Dr. Chen, please. Chen, do you want to start? Hello. Hello, can you yes. hear? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the question is divided to two questions. First is in hospital, the other is out of hospital. First, I see that in hospital, if it's only, yeah, if the patient was under, was under shock, and only shock, not arrest. If the arrest, we will put on the ECMO first, then we go, go to the, the the cast lab. Uh, if the on the shock, we will go to the we will seek for the the reason the cause of the shock, including the septics, including the cardiogenic. Most of the the cardiogenic, so we do the echo and do the swan gang first, then to to evaluation the hemodynamics. Then we will seek for the uh, mechanical problem. Then seek for the uh, vessel problem, such as the cast lab. Then if the patient was over the Hyperperfusion, such as the uh, renal insufficiency or hepatic insufficiency, we will we will put on the the mechanical support, and uh, it depends on the ejection function, uh, in uh, the the ejection status when when he he has shock, and uh, if the patient was out of hospital is a uh, another issue, for the in the, in another hospital, the transportation will be a critical issue, so. If not so far and the entropy not so high, we will encourage them to transfer transfer in the, uh, directory. But if not, I will put on the uh, IBP, put on the ECMO, and go on, go for the transportation. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're still a pretty young system, so it hasn't. We're not as protocolized as we'd like it to be. Um, most most of the other uh, hospitals only have access to balloon pumps, so we usually ask them to put in a balloon pump. We've recently started to do more of uh, sending out teams for uh, more advanced supports that can patients that can be transported and and uh, put in ECMOs and or impellas on site. Um, I think that's going to be mm -hmm. the a better strategy going forward um, uh, for us, but it's uh, it's still an evolution, at least on our side. Yeah, this is becoming an evolution, as you said. And I think in Taiwan, you have teams. Do you have teams that go out and put in ECMO, so particularly yeah. in cardiac arrest? Yeah, sure, sure. We have, but we don't have the imperial in my in my country. And in Japan. Uh, actually, so Imperial is available. However, just uh, two years ago, it uh, uh, Imperial was approved, and the penetration Imperial in Japan is not so high, so just limited in several hospitals. The so may, therefore, the may, many patients are treated by IBP or ECMO. I think so. Uh, I want to. Excuse me. I want to know why the reason the Japan not, not so many impeller in Japan. Uh, just uh, the just a reason why the government doesn't want to use it. Okay. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, cost is an important issue. You know, the impeller is is I don't know how it is in each in the individual market, but it's generally about. 10 to 15 times the price of a balloon pump at least, and at least four to five times the price of ECMO. So, so I mean, it's understandable that yeah. various systems, it's it's a big investment that needs to be made. And I yeah, don't know, exactly. eventually the cost will come down. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. However, the Japanese government just limited to several hospitals. They, they decided uh, to use or infra several, uh, we need a separate criteria. Otherwise, we cannot use. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on shock resuscitation? I want to ask another issue. I know the uh, shock IVP to try or it tell all of the, the world say IVP is, is useless for the cardiogenic shock. But I want to know how about the, the really world condition in Japan, in the other country, especially in the Asia country. Uh, uh, I can use IABP. Sorry? You know, the IB try, shock one or shock two try in uh, NHM, in Germany and the United States. The study also tell us IBP is not, is not good, it's not superior result compared with the inotropic use only. So, but in my hospital, the cardiologist still use the IV quite frequently. So I want to know the, how, how, how the condition in the other countries in Asia. I see. I see. So in Japan, the number of the uh, IVP usage is decreasing. I think so. Based yeah. The, uh, uh -huh. data. Yeah. What about in Malaysia? I think in Malaysia, we are actually start to cut down the use of IIPP after the result. Personally, frankly speaking, when you actually see the patient come in with ACS with cardiogenic shock, uh, the IIPP doesn't really work that well. Yeah, I think it's more like treating the doctors yeah. rather than treating the patient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what cases do you use IIPP? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the same, same with us. You know, when patients have true full-on shock and and uh, hypoperfusion, we're not really using a uh, balloon pump. So it's more of in the milder cases or or patients just kind of support them through. Um, but but more advanced, I think we're 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 using earlier ECMO and and Impella when 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 we feel the cost is not too crazy. Yeah, yeah. If we go back to the resuscitated patients uh, with non-STEMI, which patients uh, would you take to the cath lab? It depends on the ph philosophy of the cardiology of the surgery. Uh, maybe the only issue that every physician care is the neurological. If the neurological intake, I think everybody will go to a cast lab. But if the patient unconscious, for example, the E1 M2, did everybody get to a cast lab or just live along with the conscious recovery? In my hospital, there are different philosophy for the each cardiology. Somebody will say, okay, let's go, go for the cancer for every cases. But somebody say, okay, just wait for the cancer's recovery. And uh, I always say, when the patient is under resuscitation, ECMO is just save the time, not kill the patient. It just wait and see. So my personal attitude is go to the custard for as possible and the treat then then wait for his conscious but somebody will reverse you will wait the conscious then treat later i say it's different philosophy dr masato 
Thank you very much. It, it's a very difficult question. Actually, the obs observational data is highly biased. If the patient prolong long, long yeah. time resuscitation, such kind of patient will not be sent to the carceral. And if the patient is a young guy, and he has a history of coronary artery disease, already we, we know that such kind of patient should be transferred to carceral. Therefore, the, actually, we don't have uh, enough data in, in this situation. And in, in a hospital, so actually, in, in, look, when I look at the attitude of the insurers based on the hospital, quite different. Some hospital highly conservative. Some hospital so aggressive. Every patient go to catch up. So therefore, still, this is controversial and uh, we don't have a clear answer. I think. Yep, I definitely. Yeah, I mean, from, basically from our side, if it if if a patient has high evidence of ischemia, so if there's ongoing evidence of ongoing ischemia, relatively shorter arrest, and the neural status you don't think is fully uh, fully gone or or has some reasonable neural status, then we push those earlier. But if the you know resuscitated ECG looks okay. And patient doesn't have any and prolong the rest. We will tend to sit on those. So it's kind of a depending if there's if if you have some kind of evidence that's pushing you to ischemia, um, being the ideology we push earlier versus the rest we kind of will sit on um, until we c get a better understanding of what's going on. Do you have any other questions or comments on our subjects today? We didn't get any. Nope. Online. No. Oh. no other issues that you would like to discuss about these questions? Okay, then no. I think we're going to be okay. finishing early then today. <laughs> I'd yeah, like okay. to thank you. our speakers and our co chairs uh, for this session on acute coronary syndromes. Uh, I found it very enjoyable and uh, controversial. And uh, thank you all for your presentations and your time. I would like to thank the Asia Pacific okay. Society of Cardiology okay. and the people behind the Asia Pacific uh, Society of Cardiology Cloud webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.